In this video, I want to talk about the impulse approximation. So, we've been talking about conservation of momentum. Conservation of momentum. And it's important to know when conservation of momentum applies. And we've said it applies to a problem when there is no net external force on the system. And that's fine. However, it turns out that there are times, even when there is uh, net external force on the system, where conservation of momentum can be applied. So it's so this is when it's rigorously true, there's no net external force on the system, but we say even in addition to that, conservation of momentum can be useful when there is a net external force on the system when you can invoke the impulse approximation. And the impulse approximation what that is saying is that the external forces that do exist, the net external force that does exist, exerts a negligible impulse on the system during the time interval of interest to apply conservation of momentum. Okay, so uh, physics books and professors uh, like that statement because it's concise and rigorously true and conveys nearly no information whatsoever to the student. And if you say it with the right amount of authority and dismissiveness, students will be too intimidated to ask any questions and you can go on uh, in denial thinking you've actually taught something. So let, let's take a look at, at what that, what the impulse approximation really means. and. Uh, why it can be used. So f for an example, we're going to have uh, this object that's sliding along the ground and it is composed of two uh, separate objects. One is of mass 2 kilograms and one is 5 kilograms. So this object is moving along at 20 meters per second and it's rigged with an explosion mechanism so that when the explosion is triggered that the 5 kilogram mass uh, doubles its speed. Okay, and given that, well, what happens to the to the 2 till 2 kilogram mass when that occurs. Okay, so this system goes along and then eventually the uh, this explosion is, is triggered with this little red marks for my explosion and now my 5 kilogram mass and my 2 kilogram mass are separated and my 5 kilogram mass now has uh, doubled its speed, which is now 20, 40 meters per second. Okay, so to solve this problem, we're going to say let's use uh, conservation of momentum for, and our two points in time are initially before and initially after this explosion. And so before, our total momentum, our total momentum was, well, the, the total mass of the system. It was just one object uh, times its velocity. And let's get ourselves a coordinate system. Let's say this to the right here is positive x-axis. And so this is all uh, total mass times the velocity of the system, initial velocity in the i-hat direction. This was uh, 7. The initial velocity was 20 I hat, and so we had sort of 140 kilograms meters per second total momentum in the positive x direction. Okay, so after the collision, 
Well, we had the momentum of the uh, 5 kilogram mass. Well, that's equal to its mass times its velocity, which is now 40, and it was in the positive. Ooh, that's not a very good. <laughs> <laughs> Not a very good hat. My pin's getting carried away with me here. All right, uh, in the I hat direction. And so then the two kilogram mass has a momentum equal, and that's what we're trying to, to find. Also, it, everything's along the x direction. And so the sum of these two, if momentum is conserved, is equal to the initial momentum. So this final momentum then is 200 plus 2 v final all in the i hat direction. Okay. So let's go ahead and use this. And since w if we invoke conservation of momentum, then the initial total momentum of the system must be the final total momentum of the system. So 140 is equal to 200 plus 2 v final negative 60 to v final. And so the final uh, velocity of the 2 kilogram mass is negative 30 meters per second, so it's in the uh, negative x direction. All right, and so th that's what would happen if we could use conservation of momentum, and the question is, could we? I mean, this system was sliding along, and so we have to ask the question, well, was there any net external force on the system? And the answer is yes. There's a contact force between the uh, ground and the system, and that contact force would exert a frictional force on the system, and that's a net external force on the system. And so we can say, uh, well, maybe it was frictionless, and, and that's fine, but no system is really frictionless, and, and that's important. Now, before when we were doing Newton's laws, a lot of times we would say, okay, let's assume this system is frictionless, and that simplifies the problem. But we knew that we could add the frictional force, and Newton's laws was still valid. It would make the problem more complicated, but the physics was still valid. This is a different issue. We're saying that if there's a net external force on the system, conservation of momentum is no longer valid. So, okay, we can say, yeah, it's frictionless, but in the real world, there is friction, and that goes to the heart of whether or not conservation of momentum can even be applied to this problem, because that's the, that's the assumption that, that we have. Okay, so it's a, it's a fundamentally different issue than just sort of our frictionless world versus applying friction to, to the concept of forces. Okay, so what the impulse approximation says, if we go back to uh, what we said before, the impulse approximation says that the external forces exert a negligible impulse with during the time interval of interest. So what was that time interval? Remember, that was, that's this before and after. To use conservation of momentum, there's some T initial, and there's some t final, and that gives us some delta t, which is t final minus t initial, and we look at the momentum at these two points in time. This is our, our time interval. And so what, what sort of time interval uh, took place here? What was the time interval? Uh, we didn't really calculate it because we didn't need to do conservation of momentum, but let's let's look into the detail. Now, now we don't know that exactly. We weren't given that in the problem. But if this were sort of an explosion, then we would expect that this time interval would be very short. In fact, if we want the before to be initially before the explosion and after to be as close as possible after the explosion, this time interval could be very short, much less than one second. So let's say, for example, that the time interval of this explosion was one millisecond. This is sort of one one-thousandth 
of a of a second. This is a very a very fast explosion. It seems reasonable. Explosions uh, can take place very rapidly. So let's say our delta t is one one thousandth of a second. What sort of impulse? What's the scale of the impulse that we're talking about here? So now. Let's say, well, we have gravity. So, not gravity. Uh, gravity and the normal force are balanced. There's no net force there. Uh, but friction, we say, f I exists for this system. So let's calculate the impulse due to friction for this system. So let's do a free body diagram for original system. This is, a, we'll say, initially before, right at the sort of instant of the explosion. So there's the normal force. There's the force due to gravity on the system. There's a normal force of the ground on the system. And then there's the force of uh, friction on the system. And, and we did this sort of thing looking at forces. There's no acceleration in uh, the, the, the y-axis. So that tells us that the magnitude of the normal force is equal to the magnitude of the gravitational force. And then in the y-axis, our uh, frictional force then is equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction, in this case because it's sliding times the normal force. This, I'm just dealing with magnitudes here. It's in the negative x direction. And so this is uh, mu sub k times the, the co times the mass of the object times gravity. This is the object. This is the, the combined object that we had. That, that was here. Okay, so let, let's put in some numbers. Uh, let's say our co it's it's sliding. Let's say our coefficient of friction is is 0.2. The mass of the object was uh, oh the combined object was seven. Okay, and then um, the g we'll just say is ten to give us some rough numbers. So this is uh, 1.4, so this is 14 newtons. Okay. So that was the, the constant force. And if we're looking just at the time interval of the collision, well, that's 1,000th of a second. So the impulse that friction exerts during this uh, time interval is then uh, the, the average force, which is 14 newtons, times the time interval, which is uh, 0 0.001 seconds. This is your force times delta t for a constant force. So that is uh, 0 0.014 kilograms meters per second. So that is the size of the impulse that friction exerts on the system during the time interval of the explosion by assuming that the explosion took place in one millisecond. Well, how does that compare to the impulses that the objects exerted on each other during the explosion? Because the explosion certainly had forces involved very important. The, the relevant forces of the explosion were the forces that the, the um, two kilogram mass exerted on the five kilogram mass and that the five kilogram mass exerted on the two kilogram mass. Now those forces are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction, but those are the ones that uh, caused the changes in momentum for the individual objects. So those are the relevant forces for the explosion. What sort of impulse, what sort of size of the impulse do those correspond to? So let's look at the uh, impulse that the uh, mass, the two kilogram mass uh, exerted on the five kilogram mass. Okay, so the impulse then is 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 the change in momentum of the five kilogram mass. So that's the the final momentum of the five kilogram mass minus the initial momentum of the five kilogram mass, and so that was uh, five times. 40 minus 
2 times, uh, sorry, 5 times 20, 5 times 20, and this was all in the positive i hat direction, so it had an impulse whose magnitude, so we'll just do the impulse magnitude here, of 100 kilograms meters per second. Uh, not per second. I, I went too fast above, sorry. That gave you units of force above here. The units of uh, momentum, uh, kilogram meters per second. So there was a impulse here of uh, kilograms meters per second of 100 that the, the 2 kilogram mass exerted on the 5 kilogram mass. So now let's we can compare. So if this is the the size, if you want the impulse that the in that the friction exerted just on the 5 kilogram mass, force of friction on the 5 kilogram mass, that's a little small <laughs> subscript. Well, that's the frictional force for just the 5 kilogram mass that would put a a 5 here. Well, that's just 10 newtons times 1 over 1,000. That's just 0 0.01 kilograms meters per second. So if you're looking at the 5 kilogram mass, during the explosion, it was subject to two impulses. One, which was internal to the system. So this is, this is our system. And so there was one impulse that was internal to the system from the two kilogram mass. And that impulse, over this very small time interval, was 100 kilograms meters per second. And then there is the frictional force, which was external to the system on the 5 kilogram mass. And that impulse was 0 0.01 kilograms meters per second, which meant the impulse internal to the system was five orders of magnitude, well, four orders of magnitude, right? One, two, three, four. So a factor of 10 to the 4 or a factor of 10,000, the internal impulse was a factor of 10,000 larger than the external impulse. And so what we say here, this is the essence of what we call the impulse approximation. We have a system, and is there an external net force on this system? Well, yes. Yes, there is. And so rigorously, we could throw up our hands and say, nope, conservation of momentum does not apply, there is a net external force. But no, we, we can use it. The conservation of momentum is still useful in this problem because the time interval that we're looking at is so short that the impulse from the external net force is so small compared to the impulses generated by the internal forces that we can neglect the impulse from the external net force during the time interval of the event by which we want to apply conservation of momentum. And so that is the essence of the impulse approximation. And it turns out that in so many situations this is useful because we're looking to use conservation of momentum, say in explosions or collisions, a lot of events that take place over very short time scales. And so it, the, the idea of the impulse approximation is central to be able to use uh, conservation of momentum in real life problems.